Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that you joined our prayer breakfast that kicked us off today. It was an <laughs> excellent uh, praise session this morning. Uh, I am here to talk about our NARAP, NARAP Power Partner Pauses. And the purpose for this is so that they can share uh, how we work together and some of the maybe special programs or products and services that they have available for you to service your consumers and your customers in your marketplace. Uh, and it also gives us an opportunity to let them know how much we appreciate their support. First, we're going to hear uh, a video from Christy Furco, the Executive Vice President of Home Lending with Wells Fargo. Hello, Realtors, and thank you for being at NARAB's Midwinter Conference. It's such a pleasure to be with you today to talk about a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Black home ownership. As the only black female leading a national mortgage company, this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart and something that I am passionate about. In fact, it's one of the reasons that I joined Wells Fargo. Simply put, I want to put more black people in homes and to be able to do that from the largest platform in the country, I consider an incredible honor and privilege. In fact, I tell my team all the time that we have the privilege of making people's dreams come true, of bringing forth the reality of and dream of home ownership. And I'm pleased that we get to do that with so many of you in partnership and communities all throughout the country. So why am I so passionate about home ownership? Well, to me, home represents safety, it represents security, it represents a sense of belonging where you can create great memories and live and grow with your family. And over the last year, home has never been more important, especially during these divided times. It's also, as we know, not only important to the individual and families, but it really is the building block for strong communities. And financially, purchasing a home is the single largest purchase that many people will ever make. And it's important to help them build equity and to create wealth, not only for themselves, but for generations to come. And unfortunately, Black homeowners have been locked out of this in ways on an unequitable basis to the majority. In fact, the Urban Institute says that the Black home ownership rate is some 30 points lower than the white home ownership rate, the lowest level since segregation when redlining was actually legal. Additionally, the Urban Institute study says if we don't do something about it and really get focused on attacking the barriers that stand in the way of this, that number is going to increase. So it's going to take lenders and policymakers, advocates, and nonprofits to focus on understanding the barriers and bringing real solutions to the market to be able to solve them. In addition to my role as the head of home lending, I'm the chair elect for the Mortgage Bankers Association, and I lead the affordable housing work stream for the OCC's project reach. And I have a unique vantage point in these three roles of seeing our industry and the work that's going on to address some of these issues. Not one person is gonna be able to achieve this on their own. It really is going to take all of us working together to make a difference. And it's got to be different this time. I feel over the last year, there has been a sea change as people are woke to the issues of racial inequality and social injustice. And home ownership is just another one of those. As most of you know, at NA most of you know at Wells Fargo, we partnered with NAREB, the NAACP, with the National Urban League to be able to launch our African-American lending commitment back in 2017. Our commitment said that we would help 250,000 new black homeowners and we would fund over $60 billion of originations. We're well on our way to do that, helping so far 72,000 black homeowners and last year being the number one lender for black home ownership in the country. But there's so much more work to do. We launched our 
Dream Plan Home Affordable Project nationally and couple that with Dream Plan Home Closing Cost Credit, which provides $5,000 of closing costs benefit in certain markets. We've also partnered with our nonprofit partners in the launch of Neighborhood Lift, again, in select markets, to be able to provide down payment assistance. So we're expanding the program as the years go on and really focused on how do we bring real solutions to the market? With our community agencies on the ground, how do we understand those communities? How do we invest more in minority depository institutions, support HBCUs, and have ongoing engagement with nonprofits and project reach to move us toward our shared goal? Simply put, I wanna put more black people in homes, and I know all of you wanna do that too. So if we come together and really focus, we'll be able to make a difference this time. So thank you in advance for all of your support. Thank you for your ongoing and continued partnership. I look forward to making strides and continuing to do this work together. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much, Wells Fargo, for the support. Um, Christy is new to Wells Fargo um, and new to our family, so welcome. Um, next, we're going to hear from Michael Jackson. He is the Diverse Markets Business Development Manager, Northern Central California Regions. Michael? Thank you, Renee. Thank you. Morning, Realtors. Good afternoon, Realtors. Um, happy fabulous Friday to all of you. And I hope you guys are enjoying this valuable uh, midwinter conference and also to the information that's being shared um, uh, as you go along through this uh, conference and experience, uh, through this virtual experience. We will be out of this world very shortly. I wanna encourage everyone to please stay safe, be well, continue to be prosperous and happy and to continue to work with your clients as we go through these troubling times. Um, what I would like to share um, more importantly, is that Union Bank um, has continued to value our partnership and support the NARAP chapters um, across our footprints and as well as the national chapter. We're committed um, to provide those resources and services that you guys are looking for, uh, but also more importantly to what your buyers are looking for as well in the communities that you serve. With that said, we have commitments that we continuously to focus on, on our community level and community development level and community lending as well. One of those commitments is economic development, small business lending, providing multifamily affordable uh, housing opportunities and lending as well, single family lending and affordable loan products and programs, philanthropy work, environment and stewardship work, diversity uh, in, the workforce, in the workforce as well, and supplier diversity as, as it relates to everything we're doing from community um, uh, social and, and, and services that we provide out there. So with that said, I wanted to make sure that you guys have an opportunity to understand that when we provide those services and commitments to um, all the local NARAP chapters, we're really providing that groundwork um, and, and really footprint grassroots efforts to work in collaboration with you guys. More importantly, um, we're able to sit down with various different chapters, figure out exactly what you're looking for other than sponsorships. So with that said, we were able to sit down, work with the Sacramento Association, Sacramento Realtors Association, create a valuable public-private partnership initiative, which is called the Community Home Ownership Initiative. This is a comprehensive initiative that focuses on um, providing the education and services, um, the counseling services, the comprehensive counseling and education go with that, a, a wide variety of uh, products and programs, and of course, a, a, a big need for down payment assistance. So with that said, we put this private, uh, private public private partnership initiative in place um, all through the direction of the Sacramento Realtors Association. We were able to leverage that opportunity and work in conjunction with the Sacramento Housing and Redevelopment Agency, provide specific down payment assistance through, uh, through the Federal Home Loan Banks of San Francisco WISH program, where borrowers can get a variety of, of additional down payments and grants to go along with that. Union Bank also too also has a, uh, a grant program that goes up to nine thousand dollars in high cost markets, but in more in, in other markets it goes up to six thousand dollars. So that's an additional assistance that's needed. 
What we've seen quite a bit in this marketplace is that people um, are really striving for education. They want the education. Uh, we have a series of uh, workshops that goes along with that from a technology standpoint and virtually, virtually standpoint. But the biggest key right now, while, while everyone is in sheltered in place and working from home and things of that nature and homeschooling, education is a big key. Um, so we've had over 850 registers, registers uh, people who have attended these workshops or are looking to attend for the month of March. We're looking to bring these um, and replicate this initiative in various um, markets throughout, throughout California. Um, and we're very excited about what we do. We have a team of dedicated and committed loan officers that are working hand in hand with each individual chapter. So with that said, we are very honored and excited to be a part of uh, Midwinter Share This Information. Um, and, we'll, and we're looking forward to sharing more information on what we're doing to really help decrease that gap of home ownership that's out there and, and provide more equality uh, for the Black communities that are in place. So with that said, thank you, Renee. And uh, everyone have a great, prosperous conference. Thank you so much, Michael. Mr. Michael Jackson, we certainly appreciate you. Thank you so much. Now we will hear from, uh, last but not certainly not least, Mr. Anthony L. Weekly, who is the Senior Vice President, Head of Mortgage Strategic Growth for Truett. Anthony? Good afternoon, NARAB family. Good afternoon, NARAB family. I can see all y'all raising your hands, you know. Uh, glad to be here today. I bring you greetings from Truist Bank. And I'm not gonna talk about products or programs today because at Truist, we do have a 100% financing uh, program targeted for LMI communities. We do have a $7,500 grant. We do community development uh, financing for affordable and multifamily projects. But I'm gonna kind of level set uh, and talk about uh, 2020. You know, as I reflected on 2020, it was a life changing event for all of us. You know, COVID-19, which disproportionately and adversely impact uh, black and brown people, um, we started a work from home strategy that will forever change corporate America and business entities. Uh, then we had George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, which started and created a movement that caused social unrest internationally, not just here in the US, but abroad also, and brought the light to social injustices uh, and racial inequities because of police brutality, hatred, racism, discrimination, and bigotry. Recently, I read two books. Uh, the first uh, was by the uh, famous Atlanta attorney Ben Crump, called Open Season, which, which outlined 400 years of systematic and systemic racism, discrimination, inequities, and injustice in the form of education, you know, with the school to prison pipeline, judicial system, you have a misdemeanor, you get put in jail before you're even sentenced, and then environmentally, you know, all the EPA sites are, uh, and brownfields are in LMI communities, low and moderate income communities. The second book was by Brian Stevenson called Just Mercy, which depicts separate but not equal justice systems, one for black and brown folks uh, and low income, which includes white folks, and then another system uh, for high net worth and wealthy individuals. I said all this to say, we, we collectively, have to do something to change this paradigm. That something is to close the wealth gap. Let me repeat, we collectively must, we have to do something to close the wealth gap that exists in America today for minorities and black and brown people. The high tide makes all boats rise. And in this instance, the high tide is home ownership. The two million and five initiative matters, but we must stack hands on three critical strategies to close the wealth gap for minorities. The first is access to credit. The other is appraisal reform. And then we need a national marketing campaign. Let's talk about access to credit. Are the banks and independent mortgage bankers doing enough to make home ownership a reality for minorities? Some would say yes, some would say no. Uh, I would say, I mean, all the products and programs are out there. We just gotta get people to utilize them. It really takes a village to make this happen, not just the financial services industry or institutions. First, the GSEs. The GSEs must make affordable loans by adjusting LLP adjustments for first time home buyers and minorities. It makes it more affordable for them. The home ready, home, home, home possible product. Move the area median income from 80% to 120% or higher. Create secondary spec pools to pay up for first time home buyer loans. Nonprofits. Every home buyer should go see a nonprofit and do the eight hour course because it educates you and makes you more aware of what homeownership is, 
and it creates sustainable home ownership so that we don't go back to what we had in the crisis you know, several years ago. Regulatory and government agencies. CRA reform matters for minorities uh, and minority communities. Instead of just having a test for LMI uh, borrower and LMI track, we should expand that to minority borrower and minority track because that's going to benefit us the most. Trade associations, my NARAB family, you play a large and critical role in the life and role of uh, related to home ownership for minorities. So we all must work together collectively uh, to ensure that we create access to uh, credit. And we also must look at, you know, the differences in denial rates uh, of minorities versus Caucasians, right? And we must look at the empirical data to fully understand it. Second, appraisal reform. The industry needs to make sh sure biases and un unconscious biases are eliminated from the traditional uh, appraisal process. It's affecting our generational wealth. And lastly, we need a national marketing campaign. Uh, it should talk about the opportunity of home ownership and the ability to grow generational wealth, uh, especially in minority communities, but the campaign should also debunk the myth of 20% down. We all know it's 3% down, but typically people think it's still 20% down. Uh, and higher credit scores. You don't have to have an 800 credit score in order to get a loan. In closing, the time to act is now. The average black family would need 228 years to build the wealth of a white family today. Two million and five matters. We need you. Thank you very much. Have a great day, NARAP. Thank you so very much, Anthony. I'm gonna, I'm a little suspicious. I think that you've been in the leadership meetings. <laughs> that is covering the, up, the upcoming uh, panel that M Madam Pope, President like Pope is having, will cover, will hit on exactly what you said. That is the direction NARAP is going. We realize the climate that we're in and we are working very hard to lay out the foundation. The leadership team has laid some five pillars, so we do need to schedule that call with you. But thank you so much for uh, all the partners, for the programs and for your comments and what you've said. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you on behalf of NARAB. And that will end my time with the NARAB Power Partner Pause. So back to you, Jill. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Realtors family. Thank you so much, Madam Renee. We're now going to move into a very special segment that was created to honor our Black women leaders as March is Women's History Month. So we put together this segment that's called A Real Talk Touchpoint with Black Women in Real Estate. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce to you Ms. Janetta Pay. Janetta is the owner and founder of Janetta Pay and Associates. It's a real estate and entertainment law firm, which is based in Chicago, Illinois and Atlanta, Georgia. Janetta is the lead legal counsel and co-funder of the Tulsa Real Estate Fund, TREF, the first African-American owned and managed regulation A plus two-tier real estate investing crowdfund in American history. So we need to give her a virtual hand clap for that. She was the one that crafted that entire, entire um, crowdfunding real estate fund. She will lead us today in this panel discussion. So to Janetta, please, thank you, thank you, thank you, and take it away. Thank you, Jill, for the introduction. And I'm really excited to um, introduce the amazing women that we'll be um, chatting with today. So the first um, amazing woman is Madam Evelyn Reeves, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with. She is the past NARAB president and the first female president. So she paved the way for um, us to have leadership positions in NARAB. And she's also the chair of the NARAB Foundation. And then our second um, speaker today is going to be Madam Shanique Wabadger. Um, she is a broker and she is the current president of NARAB um, CDI Commercial investment division. So we don't have much time and I definitely want to hear everything they have to say. So um, we're going to get into it with the questions. Uh, the first question that I have for Madam Evelyn and um, Madam Shaniqua is, what's been the biggest challenge for you? Well, has being a woman hurt your business, helped or hurt your business? And so we'll, we'll start with Madam Evelyn first. 
Well, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I really never had a real challenge as a female in real estate. Um, I can't say why <laughs> I did not. Uh, because really in California, it was quite easy to uh, move around in, Cal in California. Uh, when I became national president of NARAB, uh, I was invited to sit on the boards that uh, our male presidents were not invited to sit on. I sat on the Fannie Mae board and I sat on the Freddie Mac board. So it was a lot, it was really different for, for me. And then in Los Angeles, I was invited to sit on the Washington Mutual Board here. And it really opened up the doors for a lot of us. It really made a difference. Uh, Freddie Mac was in a serious uh, position when I was president. They were about to lose uh, millions of dollars. They needed to speak with one of our Congress people. I was able to get on the telephone at a meeting there, set up a meeting. They went to the meeting, came back, they were thrilled. So that's why I really, they have always stuck with NARAP since that time. But uh, I really have not had any challenges at all. Um, well, that's, that's really great to hear that being a, a, a woman has helped you in this um, field. Um, Madam, you know, you have to remember, uh, you have to remember one thing though. White men do not challenge black women. They will challenge a black man, but they do not challenge black women. And I think they realize that with my attitude, I can have a very strange attitude at times, <laughs> but it, it helped a lot. <laughs> and I've definitely you. known that. I'm writing that one down. <laughs> Madam Shaniqua, do you have anything um, you want to add from your perspective? Has being a woman helped or hurt you? Well, I can't say that it, either way, I mean, I, I can't say that it's been a, a huge hindrance, but I will be very transparent and say something very brave. I think that in, in anything in building a business, being a single woman has, has been a hindrance because we all know that when you're, when you're in the weeds of your business and you're trying to, I'm in a very high value market, which is the San Francisco Bay Area. And when you're in the weeds of your business, you're trying to provide for your family, you know, it's always better to, to have two people doing it instead of one. Um, so more than that, I think more than anything, that's been the biggest like hindrance, I don't think it's actually hurt me. It's made me kind of um, get more intentional and be very um, tenacious about how I, how and when I do business. Um, but otherwise, you know, it, I'm with Madam Reeves. I'm in California, and and one of the things I can honestly say, I'm in a very, um, and I'm, I'm in an air, area where where the women's voices is heard, and 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 that's been a, a great um, appreciation for me being a business owner. Okay, okay, I can I can appreciate that. As a fellow single woman in business, I can appreciate that. Um, okay, so my next question is, are there different approaches to doing business from a millennial perspective and a seasoned perspective? And we'll start with Madam Reeves. Well, I, I haven't seen any difference. Um, when I look at our local chapter here, uh, the young people, well, I say they're young, especially compared to me. <laughs> they they look at they look at business the same way uh, seasoned people do. In fact, it, it has been so nice that they have come on board and worked with us on every, every item, everything that we have tried tried to do. And they wait for most of us to give the give the okay before they they move ahead on on any. Any, anything we, we try to do. They stay right in line with us. And if we need them to go out there first, they will go out there and work on whatever items that, that we feel we need to. But we work together very, very well in, in, with our chapter. Mm -hmm. Our chapter consolidated. In fact, I think because of that, it has grown. So uh, we have more members now. And this is just the month of March. Uh, a lot of times that, that we have by almost a convention time. So it has been going well. We've been working very well with the millenniums. Oh, that's that's great to hear. That's great to hear. And Madam Badger, do you have, um, from your perspective, uh, do you need me to repeat the question? Or No, I think, it, well, first, let me preference this by saying I'm not a millennial. I'll be hitting 45 this year. <laughs> 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 um, uh, but the genes work for me. I'm not going to be mad at it. Um, 
But what, what I will say is the, the, the importance of being able, I'm in a very interesting space, which is right in between millennials and right in between my generation, which is um, um, where I'm at. But, you know, I, I can flip in between the two. I have a lot of flexibility. And, and being able to shift between how millennials think and understand and comprehend versus how the generations um, bef- that I'm in and, and above me can think, understand and comprehend information is really going to be a, 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 a tool that everyone needs to understand and, and know so they can sustain and grow a business. And if you can't, if you don't have anybody that speaks baby boomer, get somebody in your office that speaks baby boomer. If you don't have anybody in your office that knows how to be cool and TikTok and understand all the challenges and all the things that you need to do to be top of mind, go ahead and make sure that you, you build those into your businesses and your practices as well. Sometimes you, you're not, you don't expect yourself to know everything, but build people around you that will help you get there. And that's good advice to build people around you. And I wish we had more time with the both of you, but our time is limited. So I'm just going to ask one last question to both of you. The last question is the best lesson you've ever learned that you'd like to share with all of us today that you'd like us to, to part with. And I will start with um, Madam Badger. Well, on my desk, I have all these yellow notes and I have all these love notes to myself and some of them are affirmations. But one of them that I have here is your gifts will make room for you. Um, and I think we all need to understand that we all have a gift and we need to, when we're walking in a purposeful life, we need to lead with our gifts because we never know how that's going to open up a door for us. Um, and, and before I leave and, and pass the baton to Madam Reeves, I would like to let her know that her gift has been a radiant for all of us. So I'd like to thank you for being our history year round. Thank you. And I'd like to echo that as well. And Madam Reeves, would you like to let us know a word, a sage word of wisdom? I just would like to say that, you know, the best thing I found is just to be kind to everyone, loyal to your clients, uh, faithful to your clients, and always look up, look out for them because that is what has really built our company and especially with females and us also being in the property management business. Like one, one of the ladies came to me and said, you know, I've watched you and I have nine buildings that I own. I want you to take these over for management since you're in the management business. But just being out there and speaking to people and being, being kind and loyal to people. And that, that's what has helped build our company. And loyalty and kindness is definitely key. So I want to thank both of you guys for your insight and your knowledge and just sharing with the community today. Thank you so much for that. And I'm going to turn it over to Jill Harrison. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Janetta. Thank you, Madam Evelyn. And thank you, Madam Badger. You guys are amazing. You give us all women and men alike so much to aspire to. Um, we can't thank you enough for your service to in dedication to this organization. So now, because we are running a little bit behind, we are going to move right into the next event, which is the significance of NARAB during this era. Everyone on this call knows that NARAB is most indeed significant. So I'm going to bring up the, the master of ceremonies, the moderator for the next event, who is going to bring up our Madam Lydia, our president-elect, that is second vice president, Ashley Thomas III. Ashley. Good morning, good afternoon, and thank you, Jill. What an amazing way to open up our morning with an amazing women's council prayer breakfast, followed by honoring great women within our organization. It truly is an honor and privilege to be a realtor. I'm so proud to be a realtor. If you miss the prayer breakfast, uh, you truly did miss a, a treat. I will tell you a brief story that hopefully will resonate with you going forward. 2011, New Orleans, young realtors, we had some great times, but the next morning was a prayer breakfast. So several of us decided to try to sneak in towards the end because it was a challenge waking up. Ms. Reeves walked straight to the back of the room and said, if there's one thing you don't do, 
is miss a prayer breakfast. And since that moment, I've been on time. I've been in the lobby waiting for the doors to open. And today I was in the waiting room for the Zoom access. I have not missed one since. And so I highly encourage you uh, to be on time and to be prompt. Uh, with that said, and as my gentlemen, make sure you always know the color, red, pink, be in compliance, and you will have a wonderful realtors experience. Um, with that said, it's my honor and my duty uh, to introduce the president-elect, Madam Lydia Pope, um, with her expertise. She has truly uh, been a leader within this organization for many years. Her qualifications far out exceed anything that I could say about her, but I just thank her for her leadership, and I know we're short on time. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming President-elect Pope. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you for um, such a great morning. Um, now, at this point in time, the goal today is to talk about NARAB during this era. It's the Sheba Report. It's a comprehensive report. It provides details view into the real numbers and facts that impacts our Black families. But I have the distinct honor and I have the distinct privilege of introducing my Congresswoman. I'm from Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio. Congresswoman Joyce Beatty. She's a native Ohioan with a strong history of connecting people, policy, and to make a difference in the black community. Since 2013, Congresswoman Beatty was proudly representing the Ohio's third congressional district. She sits on the House Committee on the Financial Services and serves on two subcommittees, the Chair of Diversity and Inclusion and Housing and the Community Development and Insurance. Congresswoman Beatty is the chair of the powerful Congressional Black Caucus for this year, 2021. We're so proud of her. Region 10 designee on the Democratic Steering and Policy Committee, and she's an influential member of the Democratic Senior Task Force, co-chair of the Financial and Economic Literacy Caucus and Congressional Heart and Stroke Coalition. She's a deputy vice chair of the Congressional Voting Rights Caucus and the founder of the Congressional Civility and Respect Caucus. She's an active member of the Lynx, the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, National Coalition of 100 Black Men, Columbus Urban League, the American Heart Association, where she previously served on the board and numerous of other organizations. She's a good friend of Ms. Ruby Wright, our national person. That's her girl and Congress, Congresswoman Beatty is married to attorney Ohio Beatty Jr. and a proud grandmother to Leah and Spencer who lovingly call her Grammy. Let me introduce to you and to others, Congresswoman Joyce Beatty. Let's give her a virtual round of applause. Well, first of all, Ma Madam President-elect and good friend, let me just say thank you. Not only for that most gracious introduction, mm -hmm. But thank you for all of the work that you have done and that you will continue to do as you lead this organization. And to everyone, let me just say thank you and how honored I am to be a part of your conference. Uh, I also want to say thank you to the chair of your board, Michelle Calloway, to Harold Carter, the vice chair, and certainly to uh, Antoine Thompson, the national executive director. Uh, you have had a full pack day, and I want to thank my brother for talking about the prayer breakfast that got you excited and motivated. Uh, we borrow from you with the Congressional Black Caucus because we say the same thing. Don't miss our prayer breakfast. And it's something about our history, our culture that sets the stage for that. But this afternoon, I'm very appreciative that you are allowing me just a few moments to highlight the value, not only of your work and all of the topics that you have been discussing, but for me to hone right in on Black home ownership. And I think that is so important because when I think about your overall conference theme, when I think about educate, empower, and mobilize, 
what a better organization, what a better business to be in than to move our communities and to educate them and to empower them. And your organization certainly is about mobilizing. Now, let's think of it. Right now, since you mentioned that I'm chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, we are celebrating our 50th anniversary that 12 Black Americans elected to Congress. And yes, our first Congressman, Lou Stokes, Lydia, right from Ohio in Cleveland, Ohio. He was in those numbers. But the brother talked about the sisters and, and how important our colors are. Well, there was a, a woman that was in those numbers. Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm was one of the 13. And their work was built on all of the work that we had fought for as advocates, as civil rights leaders, as realtors and more, the Fair Housing Act. You knew I was going there. When we think of the historic passage of the Fair Housing Act of 1968, explicit discrimination in housing on the basis of race was outlawed. But here we are today, still fighting and still talking about redlining, still trying to figure out how we can put in the same breath equity and equality in home ownership. How when someone who looks like me just the other day, the president of the United States met with our caucus in our retreat, very much like your retreat. And President Biden said, if he walked in to buy a house, same house, builders, same cost range of the house, and I walked in, same house in my community, same builders, same landscape, my house in my community would not hold his value as much as his house in his community. And that's why we still have to have conferences. And that's why we still have to bring in people to enlighten us and to educate us and to get us energized and mobilized because we're still in the fight. Why is it important? That is a question that we would ask ourselves. Well, it's important for example, the black home ownership right in the Midwest in my district in 2005 was 44%. However, that number plummeted during and in the aftermath of the financial crises just three years later in 2008. And it went to 33% in 2016. So we've already seen that Black Americans have been disproportionately impacted during the housing pandemic. And here we are now, COVID-19. It's not just a healthcare pandemic that we are dying disproportionately uh, affected by it and that our numbers are different. You know, we make up 12% of uh, the Black American population, but we're dying at 15%. We know that women don't get equal pay for equal work. We know that when we look at home ownership, we still have hurdles in the lending market that many of our majority folks don't have. So whether it is a health disparity, whether it is the impact of the COVID-19 on health or the economic impacts we have, Black Americans are paying for it. And that's another reason that we have to educate and empower people to understand the value of home ownership, to understand that it, it makes a difference. But how do we get there for some of our marginalized populations? We have to educate. We have to talk about financial literacy. We have to talk about the legislation that we write. How does it affect impact and educate and help minorities to be homeowners. Well, let me just tell you what I'm so excited about. Next week in the, Ohio, in the House, United States House of Representatives, 
we are going to reintroduce my bill that's called the Housing Financial Literacy Act, which gives prospective FHA borrowers a 25 point basis reduction in their upfront mortgage insurance reduction in exchange for taking a HUD approved housing counseling class. Because here's what we know. We may or you may get them in a home, but all too often we have problems staying in the home. That's why when we were going through this crisis, I can tell you the Congressional Black Caucus, the Financial Services Committee with the Housing Subcommittee was out front in saying we have to make it fair for both ends, for the realtors, who need to sell homes and keep people in their homes and not lose them. So we put the forbearances on the mortgages. We made sure that people weren't getting evicted, but we made sure those business owners who were renting out homes were also protected by giving them dollars up front. This bill that I'm introducing is so important because what it does, it lowers the cost of the down payment on the average FHA home loan by roughly $500 for a first time home buyer and making it just a little bit easier and more affordable to come become a homeowner. How many of you remember the first time you were sitting there and you were so excited that you were getting ready to get those keys to that first home? How many people remember that it was a FHA, you know, loan that you were able to get? to be able to be a homeowner. And so when people say, well, what does it reduce? I don't know about you, but I know when I'm sitting there and I'm trying to work through the paperwork and to get my home, if somebody told me they were reducing something $100 or $200, let alone $500, I would be happy that that saved me money for something else that I could do. So that's just one of the things that I have in my portfolio, because we know despite the history of redlining, discrimination, we know that FHA is the largest source of how people are able to finance their homes, and especially Black Americans. I think we should be looking at policies in Congress, and this is where you can help push us and be the drivers for us, that we look at lowering the annual mortgage and insurance premiums. We need to be thinking about how do we rethink how student loans are calculated for debt to debt income ratios. So when they are out of school, one of the first things they want to do is go buy a condominium or be a homeowner. We ought to be eliminating the mortgage insurance for the life of the loan and separating out capital ratios for the for the forward mortgages from home equity, conversion mortgages, portfolios, and so much more. But I, I want to say to you, looking at your conference program and looking at all of the speakers and the people who have come in to help you shape the movement, that's where we're going. If you think about our rich history, we just came off of Black History Month, and now we are in International Women's Month and studying and looking at all of the work that we have been able to do as women. When you think about how do we move the economy, when you think about what makes a difference when we talk about closing the wealth gap. And that should be one of the top priorities for all of us. How do we move to being intentional about having equal access, having equity, and making things fair? Because that's that third end of the pandemic, social injustices. And that's just not the criminal justice system. It's also the injustices in housing and in environment that affect all of the work that you do. So as we move forward, we want to make sure that we revitalize the housing market. We want to make sure that when we look at 
where we want to be in the next decade, that we are a part of moving that movement forward. I could not think of a better person that's going to be at the helm of moving us forward. And that soon to be secretary, former soon to be Congresswoman Marsha Fudd. If you wanna talk about someone who is a mover, someone who understands leadership, many have asked the question, why Congresswoman Fudge? Well, let me just tell you, as Martin Luther King Jr. said, it's always the right time to do what's right. And this is the right time for her leadership in HUD. It's the right time because so often people don't think of the entire hugeness of HUD. They, they go to one segment and, and they think about public housing and maybe section eight and they don't get beyond that. They don't think about it as a big business. They don't think about the number, the thousands and thousands of employees. They don't think about it from FHFA and how we finance housing. But let me just tell you, her background as a lawyer, understanding complex documents, her background as being a former mayor, pulling people together and understanding what community needs are and how important it is to speak up, being a former national president of a large organization, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, and pulling people together and social action programs, which included housing. But here's the other thing. She will marry poverty and wealth. She will talk about that child that goes to bed hungry, one in five in America, but she will talk about the value of having a roof over that child and that family's head. She will talk about small businesses and understands the value of your work. So many of you, as you introduced yourself, you talked about being realtors. You talked about your work and the value of it. Well, having someone who understands that as a former member of Congress who's been on that House floor and not been afraid to stand up for the least of us. All of this ties in to the movement that's yet to come, the movement that you must be a part of to help us get there. And here's the last thing. It's a challenge. So often when members of Congress or other elected officials are engaged in a dialogue or on the stage, we're always talking about holding them accountable. And that should be the number one thing, transparency and accountability. But I say back to you, thank you. Thank you for all of your services and thank you for being a part of this housing movement. Thank you for being a part of this economic movement in making a difference. And to all of the women, if we reflect back on our history, and especially brown and black women, 50, 65 years ago, we were not in the numbers like we are now, as I look at this virtual Zoom. So to be able to have us in leadership roles, to be able to have us as president-elect of such an amazing organization speaks volumes, not for the nation, not for the country, but it speaks volumes for you because it is your peers and it is your colleagues who understand that if we're really gonna build back better, it takes all of us to make sure that we are building back better. If we're gonna improve the economy for the least of us, for my grandchildren and your children and those yet unborn, then it starts with your organization. It starts with home ownership. It starts with black home ownership. It starts with narrowing the wealth gap. And lastly, my grandmother said to me as a little girl, when I said I didn't know what I wanted to do or be. No one in our family had ever gone to college. No one in her family had never been on the doorsteps of a college. My grandmother said to me, your ticket out of poverty is home ownership. 
My grandfather worked on the railroad. And when he died, he left her a very generous for those times railroad pension. And you know what was the first thing she did? She went and bought the three vacant houses on the street that we lived in. And she put two of her children in those houses and they fixed it up, fixed them up. And then they sold them and she bought two more houses on that same street. By the time I was going to elementary school and people asked me where I lived, I said, I live on my grandmother's street. And they said, what do you mean? I said, my grandmother owns every house on our side of the street. And she said to me, always remember to be a homeowner and to always make an investment. And if you invest in property, you invest in yourself and it can carry you through. And so I wanna thank you for the investments you're making in this great nation. And I thank you for allowing me to come. And for those that don't know me, I'm Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, and I approve this message. Thank you. Everyone, let's thank our Congresswoman Beatty, first for your passion and equity and equality and housing and black housing first. Secondly, we totally, the National Association of Real Estate Brokers supports your bill. We've been supporting it for a couple of years. You have our endorsement, you have our support, and we definitely look forward to seeing you at the Congressional Black Caucus. Again, let's give a virtual round to our Congresswoman, Joyce Beatty. Thank you so much for your time. We truly appreciate your passion. <laughs> Thank you and good luck. Thank you. Well, everyone, I hope that you got the information from our Congresswoman, how the passion that she's brought about Black housing, and that flows right into our state of housing in Black America. You know, our state of housing in Black America, which we call the Sheba Report, has been out since 2012, and we update it every year. You know, with the country's political landscape and the civil unrest, this year's section on the economy will be particularly critical aspect of this year's report with the credit scores, the loan pricing, the accurate or inaccurate appraisals, the underwriting issues are essential within this report. This year's State of Housing in Black America will address these issues in an effort to help us determine the most impactful initiatives that we have to pursue partnerships, forms and messaging to create what we call the American dream. Our goal is to make the next two years the most successful year ever when it comes to NARAP and black home ownership. And Congresswoman Beatty couldn't have stated any better. At this time, I would like to introduce our panelists for today. First, we have Jim Carr, who's the chairman and CEO of Turquoise Bay Investment Partners and Forbes contributor. Jim has served as senior fellow with the Center for American Progress, the chief business officer for the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, senior vice president for financial innovation and the Fannie Mae Foundation, and assistant director for tax policy and federal credit with the United States Senate's Budget Committee. He also the founder and former editor of the prestigious scholarship journal, Housing Policy Debate. Jim has testified on numerous occasions before the United States Congress and has appeared on CNN, CNBC, Bloomberg, MSNBC, Fox News, PBS, and a variety of local news stations in Washington, DC and New York. That's how one of our bios is from Jim Carr. Our second presenter, and I'm gonna go in that order before we begin our forum, is Nikitra Bailey. Nikitra is an executive vice president at the Center for Responsible Lending, known as CRL, the policy affiliate of self-help and the nation's largest community development leader. Nikitra advances national and state policy reforms that provides access to safe and responsible credit on affordable terms for families and communities traditionally unserved by the banking system. She serves on the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, Consumer Advisory Board, as vice chair of the NC Housing Coalition, as board member of the NC Institute for Minority Economic Development. Ms. Bailey is the author of numerous reports and articles 
on predatory lending's impact on people of color and women and frequent media contributor to many, many newspapers. Our third panelist, Sarita Battles. Sarita Bala is the managing director, head of affordable lending at JP Morgan Chase, where she's responsible for leading the execution of strategies to help address historic barriers to home ownership among minorities and low to moderate income borrowers and communities. Sarita has been in the financial industry for over 31 years and 23 years specifically dedicated to mortgage. She's a senior vice president and head of the retail diverse segment for Wells Fargo um, Bank. She was also with Bank of America as a centralized sales site executive and many other boards. She's affiliated with several corporate boards within the mortgage industry, such as Freddie Mac's Advisory Housing Council, Fannie Mae's Affordable Housing Corporate Board, of course, the National Association of Real Estate Brokers and the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. She's also part of the Asian Real Estate and Americans Housing Advocacy Boards and Wells Fargo Home Lending Diversity and Inclusion. In 2012, she was recognized by the 2012 by the Florida Diversity Council as one of the most powerful and influential women in the state of Florida. But most importantly, Sarita Ballard is a reverend. She's, she, she's a reverend and a deacon at St. Paul AME Church in St. Augustine, Florida, under the pastoral leadership of the Reverend Ron Walls. Our fourth panelist is Marlena Scott of Freddie Mac. She's a single family client and community engagement manager. Marlena is responsible for managing real estate professional partnerships that includes diverse trade associations and real estate brands across the country. She creates strategic educational outreach opportunities and provides insight into the market data trends, affordable product solutions and resources to help the real estate professionals enhance their knowledge and continue to grow their business as leaded trusted and buyers in this housing market. Marlena is committed to bringing awareness to Freddie Mac offering and offers the support of responsible lending, provides sustainable home ownership, and improves access to credit and equality in housing. I would like to introduce our four panelists for this afternoon, and let's get started. Question one goes to Jim Carr. Jim, could you please provide us with an overview of this year's report? highlighting some of the issues that we will explore in some details this year. I think your phone's on mute. So you need to unmute your phone. All right, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can okay. hear you. All right, so thank you, Lydia. Um, I'm honored to uh, be uh, the asked to lead the, uh, the writing of this year's State of Housing in Black America. Uh, it's always a privilege for me. And this year in particular, uh, and when we look back to last year, we know we have gone through a year that is one, in, one, one of those kind of years you get once in a century. Uh, and even then it's, it's way too much. So we had two things happening. Um, and one of them of course is the pandemic. And, and, and as we can understand, Blacks are, are experiencing the worst of it. Uh, Blacks are more likely to contract COVID, more likely to die from COVID, are more disruptive in the labor markets. Uh, and we don't yet know the uh, full extent of the housing crisis on Blacks in terms of potential foreclosures and or evictions that lay down the road uh, once the moratoria are over. So part of the report this year, we'll focus on trying to understand the effects of the pandemic on the black community because they are likely going to be substantial and long lasting. And the kinds of remedies that are being put forward so far are not the kinds of remedies that will help us recover. They are remedies like we have a stimulus bill going through the Senate now that will help, you know, sort of to allow more boats to float through the crisis. Um, but if we don't have something much more sustained and much more powerful, a lot of those boats may end up sinking anyway down the road. The second thing that happened last year, though, was arguably the most sustained, diverse, and most powerful civil rights protest probably in American history. It's, we may remember going back to last summer 
in many cities, those protests happened every single day for months on end. Uh, and it wasn't just Blacks. It, it was very much a broad swath of America. These two things together present NARAB with an extraordinary opportunity for going forward into next year. And, it, and those opportunities will be outlined pretty substantially and in detail in this year's report. One of the most important things that came out of last year's civil rights marches was the broader understanding of and much greater appreciation of this issue of uh, institutional racism, uh, institutional bias, institutional discrimination. And the important thing for home ownership and NARAB in particular is that the issues that NARAB has been pounding the table year after year after year on trying to make progress are very much driven by institutional biases and institutional discrimination. So when we look at things like the use of loan level pricing, that is absolutely institutionally discriminatory uh, because what it does is it penalizes individuals for having less wealth and less income. And also by using loan level prices, it increases the cost of lending, which by definition in economics increases the risk of default. And so we have been saying for years, we need to eliminate it. And this year we can now say it and write it in a much more powerful way around the context of institutional discrimination in a way in which regulators and policymakers may hear NARAB's words more powerfully than ever before. At the same time, we know that the pandemic, uh, its effects on the economy have, uh, you know, have, uh, are, are still in force. And so we know that we need to help the U.S. recover from that crisis. One of the ways that we can help is through more effective and broader thinking about how the housing market can propel the economy. When we look back to the 1930s and the Great Depression, that was the, the economy then actually was in better shape than it is right now. We are in a worse position now than we were in the Great Depression. And at that time, FHA was launched, Fannie Mae was launched, Homeowners Loan Corporation was launched, and the federal home loan banks were launched. So we had lots of housing. These housing programs had as much to do with providing jobs through the building of new housing that completely excluded black households. Today, we have members of Congress discussing the possibility of putting into place an infrastructure program. We know that our housing finance system needs to be rebuilt. This is a powerful opportunity for us to link rebuilding our housing finance system to address inner cities in ways the housing finance city uh, system has never done. So for example, we know that Blacks disproportionately occupy moderate to low income neighborhoods, often in housing that needs some type of repair. This is the time to recreate our housing finance system in a manner in which the renovation and repair of housing is part of the home ownership process. And the building or renewal of those houses creates jobs that go to the very residents of those neighborhoods. And since Congress is discussing a large infrastructure bill, this represents an opportunity for NARAB to actually draft its own proposal for an infrastructure program that includes uh, promoting home ownership for Blacks in a way that also promotes jobs for Blacks in a manner that is identical to what FHA did for white households in the many decades coming out of the Great Depression. And then the third thing that we will talk a lot about, uh, Nikitra will uh, discuss it, um, is the idea of an, a restoration justice home ownership program or fund. Um, we need to go beyond the things that the market can uh, support by having special programs for uh, down payment assistance and things of that nature and wrapping it into a conversation on why this is justified given the many years of discriminatory practices in the market will be very powerful. So for example, most recently we know that 
the housing market collapsed in 2007 due to predatory lending. The federal government collected over $110 billion just from the Justice Department for uh, financial misbehavior, but they didn't do anything to ameliorate the foreclosures that uh, uh, fell upon black households as a result of that misbehavior for which the federal government charged fees for its uh, improper nature. We need to help rebuild home ownership for those households. We need to rebuild uh, home ownership for individuals who knew that they couldn't succeed in the market. And we need to create opportunities for home ownership for individuals who just have happen to have low wealth and low income as a result of decades of discrimination. All of these programs fit under the category of institutional discrimination. NARAB is in the front of the row in terms of being able to explain these different institutional barriers, how they have hurt Blacks from uh, achieving home ownership going back more than 50 years, and how Blacks can be included in these recovery programs in ways that not only allow them to recover from the losses that they've experienced as a result of last year, but the losses that they've experienced or that we've experienced for the last hundred years. Uh, so I'll end it there because I know we are short on time and would be pleased, Lydia, to respond to any other uh, follow-up. Thank you. Thank you, Jim Carr. And at the end, we'll, if we have enough time, we'll take some of the questions in the chat as well. Nikitra, you know, can you share with us some of the current challenges that impact the opportunity for Black people to purchase homes? And maybe just kind of go a little bit about that restoration fund. I think your, your computer's on mute. Okay, Jill, maybe if someone can can try to help her, you can have our eyes. Yes, ma'am. Um, okay. You're not muted, so let's see here. Try your okay. com your computer, your computer. The um, volume on your the computer. The volume on your computer. No. Okay. okay. What we'll do is we'll come back. Um, if you guys can call her offline. And yes, yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you, thank mm -hmm. you. Ms. Bailey, please. DM me or your number so that I may reach you, please. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to shift gears just a little bit. We have our partners. You know, with, with NARAB to support the increase in the Black wealth through home ownership, NARAB has set the tone of using our $2 million and five, and we use that to present what we call Building Black Wealth Through Home Ownership. It's our five initiatives, or what we call our five pillars. You know, the vice presidents and I have been working on these five pillars and the purpose of this is centered around the black home ownership and the policies to educate our consumers and our members. So it's just quickly, I'll just go over the quick five pillars. One is our faith based and our civic engagements. Then we have our women initiatives and our wire program, our diversity and inclusion, which talks about the small businesses, the opportunities, the certifications, and then our, and then our multi-generational wealth. Our generational wealth, they'll be talking about that later today with our millennials. So hopefully you get an opportunity to listen in on that, on that panel. And then our government relations and advocacy, which goes with what Jim Carr and Nikitra talks about when it comes to the state of housing in black America. And then our Sheba Bites, which every month we'll be putting out a small snippet of some different policies and legislations that are currently happening you know, in America. So within these five pillars, my first question to you, Sarita Battles, is Chase recently launched a $30 billion path forward to a commitment. Can you tell us a little bit about the commitment and how it aligns with our NARAB's five pillars? Yeah, so um, first off, thank you, Madam President-elect. Um, and then I would also like to say hello to my Realtors family. Um, I am definitely with a different partner, but the same dance. We're still focusing in on advancing black home ownership. And so, yes, I would love to be able to tell you a little bit about our $30 billion commitment. We announced it in October of last year. And this is a $30 billion commitment focused on advancing homeownership among Black and Latinx um, customers and communities. 
Um, the focus is really centered around just really closing the gap um, from a racial inequity perspective. So we want to make sure that we close that gap. Um, it is five pillars. So when you think about alignment, there are five pillars to this um, $30 billion commitment, and it is for five years. Uh, the first one is to focus on increasing Black home ownership um, and affordable rental units. And so what I love about this commitment is it's holistic in scope. And so obviously, if you're unable to own a home, people still need a place to live. And so obviously, we will focus our efforts on affordable rental. In addition to that, the goal is also to grow Black-owned businesses. And so when I think about Realtors members who are brokers who own their own businesses and things of that nature, there is an effort by which we're focused on um, increasing those Black-owned businesses. The third piece of it is focused on improving the financial health and access to banking. One of the things that we think about, especially when we think about our Black people and communities, um, they are unbanked. And we have to make sure that we're providing them with the tools and resources that they need, especially from a banking perspective, and making sure that they're financially healthy. The fourth pillar around this is really supporting the African American Alliance of CDFI CD CEOs and other minority led CDFIs and MDIs. I know that we recently made a $50 million commitment to MDIs, and again, continuing to focus our efforts in on that space. And then the fifth one is really around increasing the diversity of our employees across the organization. So when you think about diversity and inclusion and the need for us to be able to do that, it is definitely necessary for us to diversify our team members here at Chase. And in addition to that, making sure that we are implementing um, some of our community center branches in some of these underserved communities. I think I heard the Congresswoman say this. I think Christy said this earlier. James has also said something about this. And this is really around making sure that we start to stabilize our communities when we think about these majority minority communities, particularly black communities. And I will end with this, um, Madam President elect, is one of the things that we recently did, and I, and I will tell you, we took a leadership role in the industry and that was to make sure that we rolled out not only just a grant program, because there are several grant programs across the country, uh, definitely being leveraged across all the lenders, and then you also have housing finance agencies. But we actually rolled out a grant here in January, and that grant was specifically dedicated to Black census tracts across this country. And so we rolled out a $5,000 grant to 6,700 Black census tracts and lending tracts. And this is where 50% or more of the populations are Black, or 50% or more of the lending is to Black people. And we rolled out a $5,000 grant. Um, that grant is available to anyone that is purchasing a home in those census tracts across the country. So there is no income requirement. There is no product requirement. Just that you're purchasing a home in any of those 6,700 Black census tracts across the country. That was not easy to do. And it's difficult in some cases to be able to talk about it. But I would tell you that we are standing courageous in that. We feel that it's the right thing to do. And we know that this is an opportunity for us to stabilize some of those Black communities that have been underserved for quite some time. So when I think about the alignment between your five pillars and our five pillars, when we think about this $30 billion commitment, there is definitely alignment there is definitely support that you have from Chase, um, and we will definitely make sure that we are there to support your efforts as it pertains to your five pillars. Thank you, Sarita, and we support what Chase has to offer and look forward to hearing about the products even more within our regionals and our local chapters, so thank you. Madam Poe, can we yeah. have um, Ms. Bailey test her sound? Good afternoon. Go ahead. Yes, very thank good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Marlena, you know, based on the five pillars, we would like to know your perspectives and your alignment with NARAB on increasing Black home ownership. Can you provide us a little insight as to what your alignment is and how that aligns with the five pillars? Absolutely. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. And on behalf of Freddie Mac, we want to thank you for the partnership that we've been able to have. You know, Madam Pope, these pillars that you and your leadership team have really put together 
help us to hone in on the necessary focus um, so that we can make an impact this year and years to come. In addition to that, there are many different affiliations that NARIB offers, and that gives us an opportunity at Freddie Mac to be even more innovative uh, in ways we partner from the Women's Council to your developers arm and as well as the Housing Council arms. So I'm going to pick out three of the pillars that actually uh, really align with a lot of what Freddie Mac is doing. So Freddie Mac has been dedicated and is dedicating a further uh, focus on making an impact with on the pursuit of Black home ownership. The first pillar I want to point out is generational wealth. Home ownership is huge. You know, it's a component of generational wealth, and a part of this messaging really includes education and how the investment. Uh, is it has the ability to sustain families for many years to come. Industry education to the realtors, to the consumers, not just on the importance of building generational wealth through home ownership, but what is available to meet the needs of the community is very important. Whether that's through affordable products, understanding the mortgage process, and of course, financial literacy. We talk about, and I've mentioned many times through the conference, um, the focus on millennials and up and coming Gen Z population. It's a known fact that down payment, credit, debt to income are some of the greatest barriers to black home ownership. And my millennial peers out there have debilitating student loan debt as well that keeps an idea of owning a home at bay. So the focus of this generational wealth heavily aligns with our educational outreach that my team does. In addition, financial literacy, which you are very familiar with, and we've done a lot of great work with uh, you know, the Women's Council in regards to our Credit Smart, it is something that is needed across the board, not just for preparation, um, but for sustaining and preserving home ownership and wealth. You know, as you're aware, you know, the last three years, or if you're not aware, the last three years, we've actually educated two, over 200,000 consumers through our, our Credit Smart uh, program. And we've evolved Credit Smart to educate consumers over the past 20 years. So what our focus now is the evolution with a focus on uh, building black financial capability from start to finish. So we look forward to utilizing that and the tools and resources we have for that first pillar I mentioned. The second is Women in Real Estate, the Women's Initiative. You know, I'm personally a big proponent and we've heard from some fantastic women today. And I'm very lucky to be on a panel with a lot of these great women today but black women especially are making a lot of moves. So this pillar highlights the you know, importance of building a pipeline through support, education, mentorship, it goes on. Single women are actually the largest, the second largest growing home buying segment right now. They're leading more households. They're being elevated to more leadership roles. So it is important for us to focus on this. And Freddie Mac, we do focus on uh, women's initiatives and we do have what we call the leading the way initiative. So we're taking the time to really dive into you know, this, this pillar. We also wanna take time to dive deeper into the data because the data is showing that you know, women are making an impact on the housing industry. So how much further can we get some you know, more information on this? Uh, one of the insights, and I heard it yesterday and I actually looked up myself, in a recent study was reported that you know, single black women make up to 31% of households. We need to talk about that because that's, that's huge in comparison to the 10% of the single black male households. So we wanna you know, support this pillar and really you know, help grow this segment. And the last, and I'll finish with this, is diversity and inclusion, of course. You know, this is close to my heart. Creating and fostering an inclusive environment is a key to success. You know, given the impact of 2020, it just further showed the gaps that we really need to focus on. So we at Freddie Mac just really want to focus on, you know, building out education and what makes what we have as differences actually brings us together and only makes us stronger. So and it's evident in the work that we're doing, especially when we have, have our business our resource groups. And, you know, we were recently able to partner with you, uh, Madam Pope, on our Black History Month podcast uh, with our recent um, equitable and housing vice president, Pamela Perry. So really understanding and bringing that knowledge to our employees of the work that you all are doing and that we're doing together to increase black home ownership. So said all that to say, I'm very excited for the journey and the work that lies ahead. Well, thank you so much, Marlena. And to close in about the five pillars, again, the goal is to create black home ownership, not just for our membership or for the communities that we're served. We're looking to go right into the grassroots, right in the heart of the communities where we, where we work, you know, where we live. So again, I wanna thank you for the information and the updates and also the support for the five pillars. Okay, let's circle back around. We're back to our state of housing in Black America, which is part of the five pillars when it comes to government relations. Nikitra, 
And I'll go back and just add the comment just to make sure everyone has heard that. You know, will you share with us the current challenges that impacts the opportunity for black people to purchase home and then touch on the restoration fund? Absolutely. Good afternoon. And thank you so much for having me. CRO is a long-term partner of NARAD. We stand with you on so many of your priorities and we believe that together we can really reach this goal of an additional two and a half million new net black homeowners by 2030. It's something that we can absolutely do. And we're most excited about the leadership of NARAB under Chair Calloway and under President-elect Pope. So cutting right to the chase, structural and historic discrimination has really put us in a position where our communities continue to be behind the curve. And what we often do in a response to those discriminatory practices is we launch forward without correcting the curve. And we actually have an opportunity right now to really get behind the curve and to do something about it. And part of what we've been calling for is a restorative justice home ownership plan. And what this restorative justice home ownership plan would do would provide targeted down payment assistance to first generation home buyers, many people of color, including many Black Americans. And by doing this, what we can do is give these homeowners up to $20,000 of down payment assistance for the purchase of a home at the outset. We can also tailor this program to make sure it reaches the institutions that well serve our community, including community development financial institutions and other lenders that have a strong track record, such as minority depository institutions, who in fact make the highest level of loans around mortgages for black home buyers. So we can target these resources to those institutions, but there are some responsibilities as well that we need to build in. We know that our nation's fair lending laws have never been fully enforced. And we have an opportunity to really use this program as a way to really enforce those fair lending laws and for lenders to do something that is proactive in terms of reaching underserved communities. So the Equal Credit Opportunity Act allows for lenders to create special purpose credit programs to target lending to communities that they actually underserve. And this is something that we need to see done that will shift the entire way Black people access mortgages in our financial services system. So by using these special purpose credit programs, lenders can actually target programs and outreach in our communities to ensure that we have access to these loans. We also wanna see these funds targeted to state housing finance agencies. One of the lessons of the Great Recession, and I was so excited to hear Congresswoman Beatty speak about this and also to hear Jim speak about this, we lost a trillion dollars of wealth after the Great Recession. And I'm just gonna sit there. We lost a trillion dollars of wealth after the Great Recession. And that was because in our communities, foreclosures were disproportionately in our communities. These were not the people who actually experienced foreclosure themselves, but these were because we just happened to live next door to people who experienced foreclosure. And we know that many of those families who ended up being pushed into those more risky loans qualified for credit on safer and more affordable terms. So we have an opportunity to target these funds through state housing finance agencies who then need to create affirmatively furthering fair housing plans to make sure they also target these funds. Because what happened after the Great Recession is that the hardest hit fund and all of those other programs really came too late for our communities. We experienced foreclosure at a much faster rate. Our neighborhood started to see record levels of foreclosure in 2006. These programs did not pass until 2010 and get fully enacted and running. So our communities were left behind. So this is an opportunity for us to do something really bold, really targeted, and something that will really move the needle and help us to bring in this net of 2.5 million homeowners over the next 10 years and really close these homeownership gaps that we've been struggling with for such a long time. It's important that we do so. We know that these exclusionary housing policies are the reason why these gaps exist. We have study after study after study that tells us the outcome. And then I'm gonna stop with why it's just beyond a moral imperative for us to do this. We need to do this because if we're gonna have a healthy mortgage market in the future, we've gotta make sure that the borrowers of the future actually can access the loan. We know based on research that seven out of 10 future buyers are going to be Black and Latino families. So we have to do everything that we can to bring those families in and make sure that they can get the credit that they 
need to thrive. We also know that this is a boost for the economy. If you look at the studies that came out last year from you know, uh, Citigroup and before then McKinsey and Company, and then after that Morgan Stanley, we know that by taking these steps and addressing discrimination, we can grow the economy by trillions of dollars over the next five years. So there is an economic imperative here that needs to motivate us to action really quickly. And I'm just grateful to be here and to partner with NAREV on this journey. CRL stands shoulder to shoulder with you. We know that we can get it done together. Well, thank you, Nikitra. I mean, it's so much information that our four presenters have to offer. We want to make sure that you look out for our State of Housing Black America report that will be out this year. And in addition to that, we want you to support our five pillars. You know, we only have a couple of minutes left. Um, Jill, I thought Shante, we can answer one question in the chat due to our time. So let's get to one of those questions. Make okay. sure that we're listening to it. I hope our members are listening in. Okay. Um, how do we find out more information about the grant program in Black census areas? Well, thank you. And I have been trying to respond in the chat room. So you can reach out to any one of our community home lending advisors that are available um, throughout the um, country. And then the other way that you can identify or find out more information is by visiting us on um, chase.com, www.chase.com backslash community lending. And so if you go out there, click on those links, and then you should be able to get to a home lending advisor that can tell you more about those locations of uh, those um, grants. And then the other thing too is don't be surprised that we reach out to you because what the thing that we do know is in these areas, we do have a tool that gives us the capability of telling us all of the MLS listings uh, that are available in those particular areas where the grant is available. And so that gives us an opportunity to also partner with you. And so don't be surprised if you hear from one of our folks reaching out to want to get in and be able to talk about those things, but that's where you can find it. Okay. And then Madam Pope, can we take one other one that just um, came in and I, does that, is that all right? Yeah, just one more. because we have. To okay. Ask. How can we create a nationwide movement around fair housing? Um, that way there's the way that it's now, it seems to be a national movement on criminal justice reform. Great, thank you. There is a nationwide movement on fair housing and it's led by our friends at the National Fair Housing Alliance. So that, that's how we can do it. We can all partner with NAFA to make sure we fight for these efforts together. But what we also have to do is we have to move fair housing from being penal to being part of the solution. And what we can do is use the special purpose credit programs as a way to create these very targeted programs in our communities to really help get at underserved borrowers. And we can see the difference, the economic difference in our communities by being proactive upfront about stopping the harmful practices that have held all of us back for far too long. Thank you, Nikitra. I wanna first thank our panelists for just the, the wealth of information and the information that you're providing for us this afternoon. Also our membership body. I know there were so many questions. I wish we could have had time to answer that. We are out of time. I wanna thank our Sheba Chair, Renee Wilson, our Vice President, Ashley Thomas, uh, Mark Austin, LJ Jenny, who's on our Sheba team and many more. So again, we want you to look out for our Sheba report that's gonna be forthcoming and as well as supporting the five pillars. Our next, our next session is called Level Up. That will begin at from, at from 2.15 to 3.30. We ask that you look in the chat for the link. We want to thank you so much. I hope you enjoy this panel, and we look forward to more of these. NARAB during this era. Everyone have a good rest of the day. <laughs>